right, Rolf. You want it the hard way. I can fix that, too. You've got 20 years staring you right in the face. What do you want me to say, that I did it? Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Martin? You got a big day tomorrow. The boys will help me keep Rolf company. Kansas City Confidential was a 1952 crime film directed by Phil Carlson that starred John Payne and Colleen Gray and some other familiar faces. I thought it was an excellent story of the wrong guy in the wrong place, who when falsely accused of being part of a bank heist, he's out to clear his name and get revenge. I thought it was a great film, and I'll talk about the movie and then give some closing thoughts. So the film opens up, and during the opening credits, I couldn't help but wonder, are those hints of the musical notes of the Dragnet theme song? So we're in this city, and we see a mysterious guy in a suit, actor Preston Foster. He's watching a bank from his window. We find out that he's retired Kansas City police captain Tim Foster. He's watching a flower truck that leaves at a certain time each day, and he's got a scheme in mind. And he contacts three different criminal characters and brings them on board for a heist. First up, he calls a nervous, skinny guy named Pete Harris, who's played by actor Jack Elam, very young here, and recruits him after slapping him around a little bit while wearing a weird-looking mask. I'm going to take care of a guy just a little too smart. Take off the mask. Come on, take it off. I don't like games. What makes a two-bit heel like you think a heater would give an edge over me? I ought to ram it down your throat. Next, he brings on board Tony Romano, played by the legendary actor, and very young here, Lee Van Cleef. And Tony is the smooth character of this trio. You don't have to tell me the score. And it's a deal? Okay. But no dames, understand? No dames. And look, friend. If you don't like it, don't knock it. His next recruit is Boyd Kane, played by actor Neville Brand, a very creepy character I caught recently in the film DOA with Edmund O'Brien. You're a cop killer. You killed one on that last deal. I don't like heroes. You can tell that to the warden when they burn you. So I'm still listening. Soon the three go to work on Foster's scheme of robbing the bank, all while wearing masks so no one really knows one another. And the plan is to use an identical flower truck to the one that normally arrives. And it works. They don't have to really shoot anybody and they get away with the loot. The cops, meanwhile, incorrectly follow the real florist truck driver and pull him over and of course find nothing, but they mistakenly bring the driver in to accuse him. Now, meanwhile, this trio of crooks, along with the boss, they escape by train, and one by one they disperse to meet later to collect the money, since it will still be hot that soon after a robbery. Well, the cops question this flower delivery guy, character Joe Rolfe, who's played by actor John Payne, who I caught not long ago in the crime film 99 River Street. And we find out that he was an ex-con, and he's a fairly tough guy here who doesn't take kindly to these false allegations. He denies it all, but they lock him up and they even beat him up each day. And this goes on for a while and then they finally get to the point they have to let him go because they found another flower truck. And he leaves, but he is not happy. You are sorry. These things happen. Thanks for nothing. Go on, be it. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. I said for nothing. So Joe has lost his job driving the flower truck and he's really having a rough time here. He wants to find these thieves who got him framed so he can get revenge and clear his name. So he turns to his friend Eddie, who's an old army buddy. He's played by Paul Dubove, and Joe had saved his life in the past at Iwo Jima. So this guy's indebted to Joe. Now, Eddie's got a connection with this character, Rick, 
after Rick Roman, who's kind of the shady criminal type who gives him a tip that this guy Pete Harris might have been connected with the crime, but he recently left for Tijuana. So Joe has this lead, and off he goes. Watch your blind. Good luck, Joe. Take it easy, Joe. Thanks, kid. That's the guy that saved your life on Iwo Jima, huh? I'd buy him. So Joe heads to Tijuana and starts scoping out gambling places. And at one particular seedy place, he finds Pete and he corners him and slaps him around. And honestly, there's a lot of slapping around in this film, but hey, it's a crime movie, so it's to be expected. Joe makes it clear that he wants a cut of the money they stole. And he plans to travel with this guy to the pickup destination. They head to an airport, but before they can board, the police arrive. They identify this Pete Harris character when he sees the cops, he pulls a gun and they shoot him, and he dies before the cops can get any information from him. All worries, senior. This man's wanted for murder. This will happen. What's that he's trying to say about dope? What dope, Pete? Although one of the cops looks at Joe suspiciously, he still manages to leave and board the plane, and he's headed for Barados, which I wasn't really clear if it was supposed to be a real place or not. I mean, the Internet Movie Database says that Barados was actually filmed in Southern California, so whatever. It's a foreign locale in Tijuana, supposedly. And it's here that we find the character Tony Romano and Boyd Kane. They're just hanging out at this house. Tony's getting smoothed with a local senorita, and Tim Foster, the crime mastermind, is there as well but he's just kind of playing it casual as a fisherman on holiday. It really looks hot and balmy at this location. Everyone seems to be sweating and uncomfortable. You know, I really got a Key Largo vibe from this place. Uh, Senor Foster, Senor Kane. How do you do, Mr. Kane? You look right at home here. Should be. Been coming down here every season for a good many years. Senor Foster, I have your tobacco for you. Oh, good, Teresa. I was almost out. Gracias. Mm -hmm. Good fishing. Thank you. Um, when are you going to try your hand at some of this fishing, Mr. Romano? In this heat? Uh-uh. I got better support. Well, anyhow, a cab arrives soon with Joe. Also riding with him is a character, Helen Foster, played by the gorgeous actress Colleen Gray, who I've seen before in Stanley Kubrick's film The Killing. Helen is the daughter of the crooked cop Tim Foster, but at this point, she doesn't know or suspect anything about her dad. There's a card game later with lots of tension and it's here that Joe accidentally drops the fragment of the torn card that he took from Pete and then he leaves. He says he's gonna take a walk into town but instead he heads to Tony Romano's room and leaves one of the robbery masks in his chest of drawers then sneaks out to watch from the shadows. And once Tony gets back, Joe pays him a visit and gives him some smackdown. But after the beating, Tony thinks he's one of the robber guys from the van from earlier. Because remember, they were all wearing masks. And Joe goes along with it, and they team up. Now, soon after, Joe has a run-in with Helen, and they agree to go swimming together the next day. Now, there's a hint of romance here. Maybe not as well-developed of a relationship as I would have liked to have seen. But in any case, he has a swim the next day with Helen, and she playfully teases him about what profession is he in. Well, Joe gets a signal to go meet with Tony, and when he leaves, he accidentally drops his gun, which Helen discovers, and she starts to become suspicious of him. Joe goes to see Tony and walks right into a trap as he and Boyd try to beat him up. So they've got Joe made, and they're just about to take him for a walk to find out who he really is and what he's up to when Helen knocks at the door and oblivious to you know who these thugs are and what's going on, gives Joe the means to just get up and walk out. And there's a lot of cool tension going on in the scene. I really like this. And Helen just doesn't really pick up on any of it though. Now, this Tim Foster has given each of these guys a note instructing them to meet him at his boat. 
But what does he have in store? And with only a little bit of the film left, I'm going to let you check the ending for yourself. No spoilers. Will Joe clear his name? Will he and Helen be able to be together and escape the fiendish thugs in Tijuana? Well, you got to watch this one for yourself to find out. So some closing thoughts about Kansas City Confidential. It was produced by United Artists and directed by Phil Carlson. His most famous film would later be the film Walking Tall in 1973 with Joe Don Baker. Carson would also work with John Payne on two other crime films, 99 River Street in 1953, which I reviewed a while back and is an excellent film, as well as the movie Hell's Island from 1955. The writing for this was by Roland Brown, who was also known for Angels with Dirty Faces, the film with James Cagney. You know, I really like this one. It's interesting in that it starts out as what you think is going to just be a classic heist story, but that doesn't take up much of the film, and then it turns into a very entertaining revenge narrative with a hero who seems jaded and angry and just doesn't want to give an inch at all, even when getting falsely accused and beaten up in jail by police. A theme I'm seeing in some of these older crime films is that of the bitter veteran back from the war, but struggling to get by. And I'll be honest, you know, growing up in the 1980s era, the jaded war hero returning to a cold, apathetic society was usually something I'd see in films like First Blood with Sylvester Stallone. And that was regarding men who had returned from Vietnam. So it's really interesting to me to see that theme here of the war hero returning, but instead they're a veteran of World War II. It's pretty cool to see that same theme, but from a different era and a different war. There was a similar storytelling element that was used in the film Ride the Pink Horse with Robert Montgomery that I reviewed recently on this channel. And in his case, he was a veteran who was also struggling with PTSD. And a crime film especially, that level of character depth really makes for a believable struggle to the film. And actor John Payne in this film really accomplished that well. We understand this character's pain and hurt as he's trying to rebuild his life. And it's devastating for him to lose all that he has worked for because of being a fall guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. It makes the story much deeper than just a revenge yarn. We want to see his character vindicated. We want to see him succeed and get back on his feet again. Mr. Andrews here with the insurance company. He's willing to give you a break, aren't you, Scott? He knows we are. Same questions, same answers. You can save your breath. It's my job, Joe. After all, we've got to make good the loss. In fact, we're willing to pay out as much as 25% of the money as a reward. That's 300000 for a lead, Joe. You're an industrial engineer, aren't you? I never graduated. That's right. Left school to enlist with the engineers. Pretty good soldier, too. Bronze star, purple heart. Try and buy a cup of coffee with him. The three thugs are all worth a separate mention as well, as I thought they were fantastic. Jack Elam, who I've seen in a number of films before, but one most fondly I have to remember, I remember from my childhood, was the character Big Mac in the Apple Dumpling Gang Rides Again. And he was this big grizzly guy in that film. And here in this film, he's so young. I mean, to me, he looks like a combination of singer David Byrne and Garrison Keillor. I, I hope that wins me some sort of obscurity prize for that weird bit of combination I put together. Thank you very much. His peculiar eye adds to his unusual screen presence. I read that he actually lost sight in his left eye from a fight when he was a kid. And that's how he has that wall-eyed stare. He's a great actor. Neville Brand was also noteworthy. His claim to fame was playing Al Capone in the series The Untouchables. He was also in Stalag 17 and also in DOA, one of my favorite crime films with Edmund O'Brien. He is just cold as ice as a criminal character, and I thought he was great in this film. And of course, legendary Lee Van Cleef deserves mention as well. I mean, obviously, I remember him most fondly from films like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and even though I rarely delve into films past 1960, you know, I might have to check out that film in the future. He's a great actor. Colleen Gray was wonderful here as well. She's beautiful and has a wonderful screen presence, and I remember her well from Kubrick's The Killing, where she played opposite Sterling Hayden. And you know, guys, in these films, 
I know you want revenge and money and so on, but come on, if Colleen Gray is interested in you romantically in a film, seriously, reconsider just leaving all that crime stuff behind. And in any case, she and John Payne would go on to act in a couple more films together. They did some westerns, such as The Vanquished from 1953. But you know, at the rate I'm going, I think 99% of all my reviews on this channel are crime films from the 40s and 50s, so maybe I should shift gears into westerns one of these days. And if you'll humor my rambling for just a minute in researching this film and the various actors involved, I'll be looking up other films that these amazing actors are in, and as I'm doing it, I'm thinking, oh wow, this film looks great, and oh, that one looks great too. These old films, I tell you, it's like going in a candy shop, you know? One thing looks great, but then another looks so good, and another, and another, and I honestly wonder sometime if I'm ever going to get caught up in watching these old classics, but I'm going to keep at it. I'm not giving up. Anyhow, enough rambling. That's Kansas City Confidential, an excellent crime film with an entertaining revenge narrative. And apparently this film is in the public domain. As you can find it all over the place online. And as of the timing of this review, it is streaming for free on Amazon Prime if you have that. And because it's in the public domain, here's hoping that the YouTube bots will give me a break and spare me any copyright claims this time around.